Hey there, you know who. Now before we start into all the detail about identifying and managing electrical hazards in the workplace, let's take a minute to make sure that we understand what those hazards are. Now, when we're talking about working around energized equipment, the major hazards, the big three, are shock, arc flash, and arc blast. Now shock is defined as a dangerous electrical condition associated with the possible release of energy caused by contact or approach to energized parts. Electrical energy flows through a part of the body causing the shock. Now there are more than a few of us working around energized equipment who have been buzzed at some time in our careers. Now shocks can range from a mild tingling sensation to a serious jolt. Now they may result in no injury or they may cause devastating injuries and even death. Burns are the most common injury from electrical shock, though other injuries such as neurological damage can also occur. Every year more than 300 workers are electrocuted on the job, and every year more than 4,000 workers miss work due to non-fatal electrical injuries. Now some people use the terms arc flash and arc blast interchangeably, and they occur simultaneously, but they're not the same. Arc flash is the extremely high temperature discharge produced by an electrical fault in the air. Arc blast is a high pressure sound and pressure wave caused by a sudden arc fault. An arc flash is an electrical discharge through the air when insulation or isolation between electrified conductors is breached or can no longer withstand the applied voltage. Then an arc flash occurs. Well, what we're talking about here is a phase-to-ground and or a phase-to-phase -phase fault. Catastrophic arc flash incidents occur almost always in applications that are above 120 volts. Now they can happen when electrical equipment is being serviced, maintained, or inspected. Now the temperature of an arc can reach more than 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. 35,000 degrees. I mean, steel melts at around 2,800 degrees. So an arc flash puts out more than 12 times that amount of heat. Now, an arc flash is characterized by a brilliant flash of light and a loud noise like uh, the sound of an explosion. This flash of light has been responsible for causing blindness, and the blast of sound has caused hearing damage and deafness. Now, when an arc flash occurs, an enormous amount of concentrated radiant energy explodes outward from the electrical equipment. An arc blast is caused by the almost instantaneous heating of the air from the flash and the vaporization of metal. Hot gases and melting metal fill the air like shrapnel. People who have been victims of an arc blast have had pieces of metal embedded in their skin, their bone, and even in their teeth. Now, as you can imagine, this blast of heat can cause severe burns. And in many cases, arc flashes or blasts have killed a worker right on the spot. Now, as with any blast, pressure waves can also cause damage to internal organs, including lung and brain damage. And if you think you have time to duck or get out of the way, forget it. An arc flash or blast can happen in a split second, and those who have survived these horrible incidents has said that they barely remember the flash. And afterward, they never knew what hit them. Now, arc flashes have occurred when a worker was simply removing a cover or trim from a piece of equipment. Arc flash and arc blasts can also occur in panel boards and switchboards, in motor control centers, in metal clad switch gear, in transformers, motor starters and drive cabinets, fuse disconnects, or virtually anywhere where there is a possible failure of electrical equipment including branch circuits. So, what can you do to protect yourself from potential electrical hazards? Now the very first issue that you need to address is can the equipment be de-energized? In the interest of working safely, always do whatever you can to work on de-energized equipment and never assume. If someone tells you that the equipment is de-energized, don't take his or her word for it. Verify that the equipment truly is de-energized. And next, you got to ask yourself, am I qualified for the task I'm about to perform? Are you able to distinguish energized from de-energized? Are you able to determine the nominal voltage of the equipment to be worked on? Do you understand the safe approach boundaries for shock hazards as described in NFPA 70E? 
Do you know where the flash boundary is? And what the incident energy exposure is where you will be working? And do you have the decision-making skills necessary to determine the magnitude of the hazards and how to protect yourself through job planning and PPE? Now, if you answered no to any of these questions, you're not qualified. And if you aren't qualified to do the job, don't do it. I mean, it's as simple as that. And by the way, for more information about job planning, check out the job planning program on this DVD. Next, you need to do a hazard analysis. Now complete the analysis by identifying, eliminating, or reducing as many hazards as possible. Once remaining hazards are identified, then determine the level of PPE that you need to do the job safely. Procure the PPE and make sure that you've had training on the equipment and the procedure at hand. And this training should include how to recognize and avoid hazards, the PPE policy, the energized electrical work policy, lockout tagout procedures, and requirements for achieving an electrical safe work condition. Okay, now let's talk about your personal protective equipment. Now you know the old saying, the best PPE in the world does no good if you don't use it and use it correctly. Now those who do not wear protective clothing while working on or around energized equipment are not only in violation of the standard, but are foolishly putting themselves in harm's way. The heat that is generated by an arc flash has the potential to ignite non-flame resistant clothing. Polyesters and other man-made materials such as acetate, nylon, polypropylene, and spandex may melt to the skin causing second and third degree burns. The most recent edition of 70E includes requirements for basic protective clothing and PPE based upon arc flash potential at the work site. Now other hazard levels or other tasks require clothing to be determined by detailed analysis. 70E even provides charts to help determine the level of proper protection required for working around energized equipment. Now these charts work together and you should become familiar with them. The first is a set of tables that assign hazard risks, zero to four, that signify the amount of energy that could be generated by an arc flash. The higher the potential energy, the higher the hazard risk and the greater the thermal protection required. 70E also provides personal protective clothing and equipment matrix with suggested levels of clothing and or equipment needed per hazard risk category number. For instance, untreated cotton, wool, rayon, silk, or blends of all these materials are examples of non-melting flammable materials that are acceptable for hazard risk category zero. Now anything higher than hazard risk category zero requires FR clothing in minimum calorie levels as designated by the current 70E standard. Now these are minimum suggested calorie levels with recommended undershirts and underpants to be worn as underlayer. For hazard risk categories 1, 2, 3, and 4, determined from the tables, there are specific minimum calories per centimeter squared levels of flame resistant clothing required. Now while there are protective clothing systems designed for use up to 140 calories per centimeter squared, when working on equipment with greater than 40 calories per centimeter squared, additional engineering control should be taken to attempt to minimize the risk and energy levels prior to attempting the task. Now take care of your PPE. As you're well aware, these items they are not cheap. Follow the manufacturer's care instructions found on the label. Voltage rated gloves and sleeves are a vital part of the PPE system. Wear them. Clean gloves and sleeves of foreign substances and remove any traces of oil or other flammable or combustible materials. Gloves, sleeves, and blankets must conform to ASTM standards and must be marked with dielectric test dates. Using gloves over six months after their test date is a violation. Inspect your PPE before putting it on. Look for holes, tears, punctures, cuts, swelling, softening, hardening, loss of elasticity, and stickiness. If you see a problem with the PPE, remove it from service. Store items in an area that's clean and not subject to temperature extremes. It's always better to complete an arc flash hazard analysis and reduce or eliminate as many hazards as possible. Then decide on a reasonable PPE policy.
to address the remaining hazards. 70E suggests a clothing system in an Annex H of the standard that may simplify FR clothing requirements. There are many, many tasks that you probably do in the course of your job that require specific PPE for protection. Tasks such as taking voltage readings, taking amperage readings, changing breakers, adding knockouts or fittings to panels or enclosures, pulling wire into energized panels, or adding circuits to energized panels. Every one of these tasks requires that you know the proper protection for each task and wear your PPE. Now before I conclude, here are a few common scenarios that should be familiar to just about all of you. You or one of your co-workers has probably found him or herself in a similar situation on more than one occasion. The first is working on equipment that has not been de-energized. Now come on, let's be honest. That's an all too familiar situation, isn't it? Your supervisor tells you to change out a breaker and a panel, and there's a process running. You can't shut down the circuit. So you think, it's not a problem. You've worked on energized equipment dozens of times, making hot taps for a feed, replacing lighting fixtures without de-energizing the circuit. But just because you've done it dozens of times, doesn't mean it's no big deal. It means you've been lucky. And this time, your luck could run out. Now, if you've watched the job planning program on this DVD, you've heard me say, never assume and always do everything you can to ensure that you're working on de-energized equipment. When you're working on or around energized equipment, you're playing with fire, literally. Okay, our next scenario deals with one of the other programs on this DVD. Test before you touch. Now a couple of things here. First, when you pull the disconnect switch, don't assume that all the blades are disconnected, especially in a facility with a lot of airborne dust and debris or other environmental issues. The blades can get easily stuck. Could be only two of the three blades open, but what about that last blade? You gotta open the box to verify. Uh, but we heard the motor shut down. I mean, that proved there was no power to the equipment, right? You see, that's, that's a very dangerous assumption. Even though the equipment shut down, with one blade still engaged, there could be enough energy in that circuit to kill you. And another thing, what happened to lockout, tag out? Even if you're doing only a five minute project, you gotta lock out that circuit if you possibly can. And as you can see by this example, even the lockout, tag out procedure is potentially hazardous until the disconnects have been proven to work and the voltage has proven to be off. Let's look at scenario number three, lack of respect for electrical hazards. Now look at Bill. Because he's working on what he considers to be a low voltage job, 480, he feels like he doesn't need gloves or any other PPE for that matter. Now he's done jobs like this a bazillion times. Wires have never come loose. Hands have never slipped, tools or parts, they've never fallen. Now when you've gotten away with sloppy work habits for years and years, some guys become complacent. Complacency created by lack of respect for electrical hazards. And believe it or not, complacency can get you killed just as sure as incompetence. Use the proper PPE required to do the job safely. Now you may have dodged the bullet for years and years, but this could be the day you get hit. Don't take unnecessary risks to put yourself at risk. Now this last scenario is something that we need to all think about every time we go to work. Are you being set up? I mean, Bill started out on the right foot. He's had his job planning meeting this morning. He's got the right PPE, and he's taking all the necessary protective precautions. But what he doesn't see is the top of that box. There's a knockout that's been left uncovered. Now, we all know that holes are supposed to be covered, but for one reason or another, that hole has been left open for months, maybe longer. Check your work area around energized equipment. Has someone unintentionally set you up? Are there tools left where they shouldn't be? Fuses, screws. Suppose Bill's got a fight to get that door open on the panel. And suppose one of those screws drops right down in that hole. Now poor Bill ends up with an arc flash or an arc blast with his face inches from the interior of that box. Take a few minutes to check. It can save your life. 
That gives you a brief look at Electrical Safety 101 for all of you who work on commercial and industrial job sites. Now remember, this video is not intended as a training program. It's an overview. For more information, refer to the latest edition of the NFPA 70E. And keep in mind, almost any job you perform while working on or around energized equipment has the potential to put you at risk. Serious risk. So make sure that you and your co-workers are adequately protected, don't take shortcuts, and never assume.